considering the situation of Latin America and the Caribbean as a mostly middle-income country region, what are the main uh, challenges you see in developing and building institutions for uh, sustainable development in the current context of technological change and uh, basically the global, the global changes in, in, in the current context? Um, yes, what, um, what we were working on with the um, idea of looking at the politics of the middle income trap was to say, if countries that are not making the transition to high income um, uh, already know what policies they should adopt. And here there's a great consensus among economists that they should invest in human capital, in education, in infrastructure, in investment, in R&D. So these are all well known. So the question then becomes, why aren't all countries doing these policies? Um, and um, we set up our answer in two ways to say that middle income countries are different. Um, first, because the challenges they face are enormous. So the leap to get from middle income to high income, especially in terms of education and, and um, things like innovation and R&D is huge. And to make that leap, they need strong institutions. Um, so you, it's not just an exchange rate policy or a trade policy. You need to build the, the schools, the laboratories, the research facilities, and so forth. Um, uh, to do that requires, in our view, strong political coalitions. Um, and so the difficulty for middle income countries is that when they face these institutional challenges at precisely the time, they have sort of fragmented societies. And we look particularly at three divisions. One is the overall levels of inequality, which are quite high. Um, another is the division between foreign and domestic business. And the last is in the labor market between workers in the formal sector and those in the informal sector. So all of these things make cleavages and fragmentation make it difficult to find political coalitions that can support the long-term investment and in institution building. Thank you very much. So, so what are in your views the, the key drivers of this institutional building or the, the key aspects or incentives to precisely generate this type of progressive transformation? Um, yeah, I mean, we look at it, you, you can sort of break it down to say who would really be for an education coalition. Um, and, you, you, you know, you can find some businesses are really concerned with the overall level of, of uh, education, some citizens and workers are, but you find, for example, workers who are in the informal sector do not require much education for the kinds of jobs they have, so there's a disincentive there or workers um, in, or excuse me, firms like big multinational firms or um, some large domestic conglomerates, they can train their own workers. So they have private solutions. So those that we kind of try to see what, what different groups might be interested in. It's, the small and medium sized firms are, are possibly where they have high skill needs and they can't have private solutions. So they might be the most interested in this kind of upgrading. Okay, and in the case of uh, Latin America, where in many societies there's a big gap between uh, publicly delivered services of lower quality and privately delivered uh, services of higher quality, do you see specific uh, recommendations to, to deal with this issue? Um, yeah, yes, I mean, the recommendation would be to, to work to invest to improve the, the public education um, uh, uh, sectors. I think Chile has been doing recently. Um, uh, but from a political point of view, the division between the public provision and the, and the, and the private provision becomes important because if you have um, richer families that um, are getting private health care and private education, um, sometimes private security, um, then they have a lower incentive to want to push for more investment to improve public services, education, healthcare, and so forth. So that creates a political tension there um, that's difficult.